this is where I come from. Uh, basically, MVP is uh, working in, in mobile EEG space. Uh, so um, this is one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is, is modulation. Here, I ho hope to, uh, to get joined by, uh, by Mr. Data from Soterix Medical. So uh, applying some kind of stimulation, whether, uh, well, actually most often uh, uh, of uh, magnetic or electric nature uh, to modulate the EEG data in some way. And this is how, how it looks like in, in the end. Uh, Professor uh, Alex Casson uh, doesn't give me much space to, to shine because I like to, to call myself a pioneer in mobile EEG, but even before, uh, before that uh, started being my, uh, by my not full time, but even my interest, uh, Professor Casson had a, I think 2010 paper on the possibility of um, uh, getting mobile and going out out of lab and 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 what uh, what we could uh, we could do uh, about it uh, if I'm correct, uh, Alex, is it true? So I I cannot um, help but but kind of ask the question there. Do do you, do you think that EEG will um, will become uh, the day of uh, a part of everyday life at some at some point in future? So that's an interesting question and a slightly different question to the will we be able to do mobile EEG um, you know, in naturalistic settings. So for, for that kind of second question, I think the answer is yes. I think um, we see that emerging, we see people doing out of the lab experiments um, and that's only going to increase and particularly over the next five, ten years um, when all of the technologies that are already in different parts of the um, academic literature, when they really coalesce into productized units, well, I think we'll see really high quality EEG out of the lab. Um, now, will that then translate into every day? That, to me, boils down to kind of essentially social acceptability and electrodes, ultimately. So, of course, the, the big bet there are around in ear. EEG, behind the ear EEG, where essentially if it's integrated into a hearing aid case, say, um, actually it's not visible that, um, it, it, it's not visible, you know, you could be doing monitoring, nobody would ever, ever know. And I see that being highly credible um, for everyday stuff. Will EEG with a full head montage? Um, become an everyday occurrence, um, I think I'd be skeptical um, because head gets in the way, the setup is too big. Um, you make me feel a bit old because I've been working in this since 2006, not <laughs> 2010. Um, that's, a, that's when the papers really started hitting. Um, but I remember we started by working with uh, people with epilepsy and they would come to a tertiary care centre in the UK and this was near London, they would get the tube there. And we would hear stories of they would come and they would be um, crying because people had been looking at them, pointing at them, you know, because they were doing ambulatory EEG back then to, 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 to monitor um, for intrictal events and, and similar. And if you've got to do a full head montage, the EEG instrumentation is a lot smaller, it's much better quality but you've still got electrodes everywhere. And I think that's a big jump to, um, jump to, to make in terms of that social acceptability. Okay, this was a, this was a, a good answer. I, I, I have uh, several more questions adding on, on top of that, but uh, I understand uh, that um, maybe it's a, it's a good, uh, good uh, uh, opportunity for our audience to hear more about what you do and what you do in the, in the space of also stimulation, and um, uh, I'm sure that people have heard about uh, you at least uh, from this space, uh, if, if not for other things, then for the, the great works in the, in the artifact rejection with, uh, with simulta uh, simultaneous uh, stimulation recording. Um, uh, you can maybe start if you want to have the share screen um, option and, uh, and let's take it from there and then uh, we'll uh, ask our audience to also ask questions there. 
Um, so hopefully you can see that. Um, uh, as I was saying to, to Ivan before we started, I was aiming for about 10 minutes of background. Um, I might be slightly longer than that, but do stop me if I go on, go on too long. Um, I couldn't quite think what slide to cut. Um, what I wanted to do to set the kind of flavour for this um, discussion was essentially start by giving a little bit of a, of a background um, and particularly where, where, we're, where we're com we've been coming from actually and then to highlight two studies um, that we've done in recent years um, that highlight different aspects of modulation and naturalistic settings and I kind of figured that we're recording this so I might skip through some of the slides fairly quickly and of course you can always pause it on the playback if you want to read some of the some of the detail that's there it's a new opportunity for doing it by Skype rather than in sorry by Zoom rather than in in person so yeah so I started working in this space um, back in 2006 and I dug up this slide um, it was branded for different university originally um, but these were the figures that we were using back then to talk about um, mobile EEG. So this is kind of clinical grade stuff. So we're not using head caps, we're using kind of collodion to hold electrodes in place. Typically for 24 hours, um, nurses have no problem getting good electrode contacts for that if you use glue to keep them in place. But then of course the recording electronics was something you had to wear at the waist. You had to bring the wires down the body that picks up huge amounts of interference um, and quite a limited range of application areas. AEEG has historically been about um, epilepsy diagnosis. And so over the years, um, this is actually a slide from, from a few years ago here now. What we've seen is just an explosion in purely head mounted um, wearable EEG, a big explosion in um, the applications that are being uh, enabled as a result of that. One of the key things you can do in terms of improving your data quality is to remove the wires, make the wires as short as, short as possible. Um, and so all of these are just intrinsically driving up the data quality, plus the huge advances in the actual um, EEG instrumentation um, that, that, that's in there as well. And so, my lab over the years has looked at um, quite a few uh, different aspects of enabling that transition and how we take it, how we take it forward. So I'm based in electrical and electronic engineering. And so we started off very much by looking at low power custom microchips. Um, so doing um, ASIC design, both for collecting the EEG in a um, physically small, low power um, front end, but then also for real time analysis of the EEG. So we've done both the continuous wave of transform, the discrete wave of transform. And when we start to talk about modulation, and particularly closed loop modulation, as we'll get to uh, later, it's about being able to do real time analysis of the signals that we get. It's not enough just to have a, a low power front end amplifier. And then, of course, after a while, actually, um, we've got um, amplifiers now, right? There's lots of different amplifiers out there that you could just buy off the shelf. You probably don't need a custom ASIC one. Um, and the challenge is less that power consumption, the, the massive batteries that you needed in those waste mounted units, and it becomes some more about the electrodes. And so, in recent years, um, we've paid attention to that problem, um, principally by using kind of printing based approaches. So these are all different variants on printed electrodes. Um, with the idea being that we can personalize. So it's not one um, electrode um, for every part of the head or for every person. For different places, for different types of hair, we can have a different electrode, hopefully get a better connection to the, to the, to the person. And we talk about modulation, um, uh, as, as part of personalized medicine, like we're looking to do um, to, to modulate the brain and do that in a closed loop so that we analyze the EEG um, and tailor the 
stimulation, the modulation that we give to a person. But actually we're doing more than that. We're personalizing both in terms of that data driven responses and the manufacturing of the physical unit so that you get the best connection and setup for each different person. Yeah, so what we've been coming on to um, more recently is this concept of closing the loop. So again, I went back in my slides a little bit. Back in 2009, you know, um, I put together the top part here, which was about um, what a system breakdown looks like. Um, and we got you know, EEG on one side, and we want to get that up into the cloud, essentially, as we call it today, in order to do data mining experiments, do big data, all of that sort of, sort, sort, sort of thing. And if we compare that to the 2019 version, you know, there's a few differences. Um, I've learned how to use color in my images, for one. Um, but actually, the big one is the feedback slash treatment line. We're no longer talking just about getting data. Um, and this is where modulation really, really comes into it. You know, to a first approximation, we can get data. Right? There's lots of lovely amplifiers out there. We use the M brain train one in, in, in my lab, for example. And we can get data from you to the cloud. You know? And so there's ways we can, we can do better with more research to do. But that upwards pathway, the green pathway, that exists. And so a number of years ago now, we started to look at technologies for that purple going back the other way, using our data to affect the person. And yeah, this is something which wasn't on the radar back in 2009, um, but today is, 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 is very much so. So just to kind of set the scene, I just wanted to highlight kind of two studies that we've done um, briefly. The first one, looking at um, the environment. Um, and this was part of the description of this, um, this, this session, which wasn't necessarily just looking at deliberate stimulation of the person, TES, TMS, that sort of thing, but looking at environmental cues. And we did a study um, a few years ago now, um, looking at this. And the key technical challenge that we were looking at was one of, um, we wanted to do a free movement EEG task. So people would move around a natural environment um, with no constraints, and of course you get lots of motion artifacts. And we proposed to tackle those, not by doing lots and lots of clever um, motion, art, motion artifact removal, and of course there's lots of techniques out there for doing that, but, by um, doing a time-gated analysis, linking the EEG with eye tracking. I.e. saying we're only going to analyze the EEG when the subject is looking at an area of interest. And when we gate it like that, um, actually a lot of the time periods where um, you have artifacts, they don't matter because they're not a, a section that you're going to analyze anyway. And actually we cut out much, much less data than you might think. And because the technical challenge in this, of course, is that what we end up doing is putting two wearable units on the participants. And of course, these don't talk to each other. And the key limitation in terms of um, portable EEG today compared to um, in lab stuff isn't really the data quality. It's about the sync options, about how do you get auxiliary signals in there? How do you get high time precision? All of that sort of stuff, which you normally have a TTL trigger for. Um, and what we realized was that both of our units have head mounted gyroscopes in them. And they record, and you can see on the, on the bottom of the screen here, they record extremely similar signals. And so we could use that to do dynamic time warping and accurately align the EEG um, with the eye fixations and get a very high time resolution analysis. And so what we then did was a color priming experiment. So in the lab, which is quite old hat, um, if you um, prime a person to expect a, a particular color, so here we've got um, 
some mannequins which are dressed in particular colours, um, some um, pictures which are in particular colours, and then dresses on the on the shelves which are either in that colour or not in that colour. And you expect to see alpha asymmetry depending on whether somebody's looking at a response, whether, whether they've been primed to, but whether they've not. If we wanted to do that, provide a person to move around freely, uh, that priming is our modulation, as we talked about in, in this session. And we wanted to only analyze the short durations while somebody was fixating um, on either a prime color dress or non prime color dress. So the average fixation duration was 235 milliseconds. So we put a lot of thought into how do we extract um, alpha asymmetry um, in terms of getting that time resolution. Um, and it, it, we trade off it, um, our time resolution for our frequency resolution. So it's a slightly different time frequency transform compared to what most um, EEG papers would, would look at. But we could do it. Um, we ended up getting rid of about you know, um, 15, 16% of our fixation. So actually, um, yeah, this person would really, the, the participants, sorry, were moving about freely, they could do whatever they liked. But because we were doing a very time targeted analysis, actually, we didn't get as much, rid of as much data as you might think. There's still a good amount of data left there. And the expected alpha asymmetry result popped out very quickly and easily. Um, you didn't need to dig very deep in order to see um, that well verified result from in the lab, but now in a, um, in a free, moving, free moving environment. And what was even nicer was that we can then start to pull out, um, well, we used EEG lab to detect uh, motion artifacts in the EEG. And we could look at, well, how much motion was there going on in both the gyroscope and the accelerometers. And what we saw was that the EEG was much more sensitive to gyroscope type, so angular rotation, than accelerometer type um, linear backwards and forward type movement. And we've got an XYZ direction, and we were most sensitive in the Z axis. So that is uh, like that, like, like that, moving your, moving your head. The threshold to induce an artifact in the EEG was much lower, statistically lower, um, with that motion compared to others. So we're starting to get insights into the motion artifact generation, generation process in addition to the, the modulation um, effect. So then the second study, um, and Nikhil, who is on the, on the Zoom, has, has done a lot of the work for this, was to start to look at um, modulation, and in particular, to move towards closed loop modulation. Because people have been looking at um, modulation for a long time, and, you know, there's lots of debate around, um, bit, excuse me, around variability, um, around um, just how reliable is it, um, exactly what's going on inside the brain, are you stimulating where you think you're stimulating, and closing the loop, making it individualized, state dependent, again, personalized essentially, so that's made to personalized medicine, not one size fits all, um, is, it's hypothesized, I think it's mainly a hypothesis still today, to say, um, actually, this might be a way of getting much better performance of understanding why is it so variable between different people, between different studies. So today, we've got quite a few different platforms um, for, for doing that. So I'm gonna, gonna mention the one on the right-hand side here, mainly. We actually started off by doing um, electrical stimulation, and I'm going to speak in a different session um, tomorrow evening about electrical stimulation and um, artifact removal. But essentially, um, when you start to think about kind of closed loop EEG plus electrical stimulation, actually it's pretty hard work. It's because it introduces lots and lots of stimulation artifacts. So you can't close the loop straight away. But the first thing you've got to do is get rid of that simulation artifact. And we can do that with big question marks of do people really believe you got rid of it or not? 
but you know, you've got that technical talent. But I feel if you do any um, public engagement on this, if you speak to um, users, clinicians, you know, um, and you say, well, we can do electrical stimulation, but we can also do sound stimulation and visual stimulation. They're like, but why, how are you doing electrical stimulation then? Um, you know, sound is a much more accepted modality. It's um, raises many fewer questions in people's heads. Um, it's a much more kind of, yeah, everyday um, thing to have headphones that are being worn. Um, and so actually you get a very different public view coming, coming out with regards to uh, what is kind of acceptable and, and what sort of space is that. Um, and so we've been building um, out platforms for that. We've been doing that particularly um, for chronic pain. And there's a couple of videos here if you want to, to, to follow the link. This is a clinically led project. So I, I kind of skipped over the clinical evidence for visual and audio, audio stimulation for chronic pain. Um, but it's out there um, in the literature and it's being, being further verified. What we were putting together here in terms of the technical work uh, is an app-based platform. So we can do from mobile EEG and we can do mobile um, modulation, either visually, um, just by flashing the screen, essentially it's an SSVP, or um, by sound, in which case it's a binaural beat. Um, and as it stands, um, this is done in the open loop. So we might be collecting EEG data, um, but we're not using that to change the stimulation, where the, the, the stimulator is turned on and you get what you get. Um, but in the platform, there is some real-time EEG phase analysis for enabling the next step. Um, and so that exists. Um, again, we've done user co-design on this. Um, and you know, we get a mix of things coming through. Um, so I like the, it was so easy to use, you know, you just have to tap the screen, it's brilliant. You know, that's a very nice feedback. We still see lots of variability in here because the next response says I would go for a very low frequency. Well, I said I'd go for a very high stimulation frequency. So there's still variance and lots of work to do in terms of proving it's it's effective. But um, you know, a lot of the, the, the a lot of work has gone into those font sizes aren't random font sizes, it's been done with users to guide the design. And essentially that's now out being used. Um, in studies which are actively collecting data. So from the technical point of view, where we go next is to close the loop. Um, and so for this, we're using the Embrane Train amplifier. It streams data in real time to um, our app using their API. Um, we analyze it in real time, and then we can adjust the stimulation based upon it. Um, we don't have any results that um, I can share at this point in time in terms of um, if it's better or is it worse than just open loop simulation. We have the platform, it exists, it's fully tested. We've used it on about 10 people, we have the data. We need to polish the data and the analysis a little bit more before we can have any firm conclusions. I, with all of the personalization, one of the key things was that we're learning is that you get a lot of degrees of freedom. And so actually with a platform as it exists at the moment, um, we've got seven different ways of closing the loop on the modulation. <laughs> um, and so you could do seven different experiments for closed loop um, portable naturalistic modulation. And doing a robust experiment where you probe into just one of those in depth um, we still need to fine tune that. Um, so you're going to pick, you're going to do some preliminary work to pick the best one, hopefully. Um, and actually doing personalized closed loop responses. Um, I quite like the, what we tend to say is we've got the, the, we've got the technology, but our technology to do things out of the lab is in advance of our ability to do robust experiments out of the lab. Um, 
And so a lot of learning about um, now we've got the baseline technology. There's lots of improvements we can, we, we, we can do potentially. But now we've got that baseline technology in place. Um, how do we learn to do robust experimental modalities account for a lot of control that we have compared to in lab, in lab situations? Um, that's going to be the, the real research frontier. Right, so that's what I wanted to highlight, hi highlight in terms of setting the scene. And I, I think as Ivan said, I could, I could, I could speak all day on, on different topics if we wanted more detail on, on any one of them. Uh, yes, that was, this was a really uh, lovely overview, in my opinion, and I, I, I really enjoyed seeing this. And uh, just to be sure to mention to um, other people listening, uh, what you do is very complex. Uh, I, I can tell that from, from personal experience, uh, being in touch with many people and, um, and also having some hands-on experience. These kinds of setups are, are very, very complex. And uh, what you do in real time, even if you don't have a, a real time closed loop, uh, but you certainly uh, solved a lot of problems uh, from synchronization to artifact removal and, and going further. These are uh, each in itself uh, constitute a, a really large, large uh, challenges. Uh, I kind of wanted to, to step back for, for a moment and, and, and ask uh, maybe a naive question. So uh, why do we go to naturalistic settings? Why, why do we tend to go to naturalistic settings at all? Uh, in, even uh, when, um, when uh, doing some, some sort of uh, neuromodulation. So uh, I, I keep hearing an argument that uh, maybe due to, the, the, due to the various kind of distractions, you have a, a psychological uh, sort of artifact uh, with the, uh, that is interfering with what you want to investigate. Can you tell a few words about what you, what you think about that? So to me, the, the motivation for kind of naturalistic EEG is a little bit different to the motivation for naturalistic um, um, modulation. So for EEG, it's very much about that balance between realism versus control. Um, and a lot of our kind of basic neuroscience type studies um, are focused on lots of control and not necessarily a lot of realism. And um, now we have the ability to um, do stuff out of the lab, you know, see if we get different information um, or, or uh, see if some of that stuff that we've learned in the lab still applies, but also just getting a better picture of a person. So a lot of this work, um, yeah, the, the, um, we, we, we speak a lot with the Army Research Lab in the States and um, a lot of military people would always say if something goes wrong, um, if it's with equipment, they've logged everything, they know exactly what's happened. With the person, okay, we've got some devices, but there's still a lot of information that's missing. Um, and anything that they can do to get more information about what, what happened, and this doesn't just apply in military situations, it applies in all manner of critical operator type, type situations. Um, getting more information about what's actually going on. And of course, the, the brain is a key part of that. For me, that's slightly different to the modulation um, motivation, which um, I think some people would debate this. And certainly there's a long way to go. Okay. But it, it is about providing um, essentially treatments medical devices, um, intervention, um, which aren't pharmaceutical. Essentially, pharmaceutical development is becoming more difficult. It's becoming more expensive for each new drug that's um, coming on. If you look at chronic pain, as an example, actually, there's been some refinements, but there haven't been fundamentally any new um, pain relief methods approved since about the 1960s. Um, and so there's a need to explore something else. Um, and you, it's not going to be economic for them to come in, to, for, for people to come into the clinic every time they want something. It's got to be in the home setting to, to, to some extent. There's lots and lots of work to do to prove that it works, to prove that it's got a patency, um, to prove that um, it can be done safely by lay users, 
all of that sort of stuff. It's a long, a long road that we're on. But in terms of, again, say chronic pain, the cost of chronic pain um, is larger than our diabetes um, and obesity combined. Because a lot of the chronic pain affects people um, younger while they're still working. So there's lots and lots of productivity um, here. Um, and given that, um, I, I, I see it as an alternative that, uh, to, to, to traditional pharmacological interventions, which there's going to be challenges, but the potential means it's definitely worth investigating. Okay, okay, I see. I, I actually have a question that you touched upon here. Uh, we are seeing a surge of uh, all kinds of uh, electrical stimulation in consumer space uh, now, and um, uh, every now and then uh, you see uh, you see a device that open uh, that offers some kind of uh, brain zapping, claiming to uh, boost your uh, skills and I know that you you have done some work on um, on uh, memory improvement uh, uh, with um, uh, combining uh, uh, the uh, TAC right as uh, with the and uh, maybe maybe you can you can uh, touch that that point a bit like does it work and how safe <laughs> it is <laughs> um, so um... In terms of, kind of does it work, um, I, I, you might be best to kind of send that question to a hardcore um, kind of neuroscientist. Um, so, um, and, and, and there's plenty of people kind of attempting to answer exactly that, um, that, that question. Undoubtedly, there's lots of variability and lots of debate. I think particularly for the electrical simulation, because of the nature of the conductances of the, of the skull, we know a lot of the current doesn't go into the into the brain at all, um, and that's different to some other other um, other modalities. Um, so we've looked at um, electrical stimulation in um, in working memory tasks, and there are papers out there that have shown um, um, improvements in working memory. Um, actually, that wasn't the aim of our experiment. We were just essentially using it as a task um, uh, because there's different ways of affecting working memory. And so it's more just an example task than, um, uh, than necessarily being the aim of our experiment to be to enhance working memory. Now, what we've also done, and I, I, I cut from, from the presentation, was what I would call sleep engineering. So this is where you play targeted sound stimulation um, to somebody while they're asleep. Um, and with that, you can manipulate the features of somebody's sleep. So you can trigger more slow oscillations, you can trigger um, sleep spindles, um, and you can manipulate some of the sleep architecture. And of course, um, sleep architecture is very um, correlated with things like memory consolidation performance. Um, as you age, um, you have very few slow oscillations. So I'm too old to be in my own experiments now for that. Um, and as you move into mild cognitive impairment, you have no slow oscillations at all, um, and, and so on. And so there's lots of studies around, does this actually work? Um, and what it seems is that for one particular method of measuring um, memory performance, yes, it does. That replicates very well um, across lots of different labs. When you look at any other way of doing it, <laughs> it doesn't. And there's lots of behavioural work still to do there to really uh, kind of unpick exactly what's um, what's going on and improvements in um, just how good the, the targeting the targeting is. So I think some of the early papers in the field they had were kind of they were looking at closed loop stimulation targeting a particular phase of the EEG. And they were getting that to within kind of plus minus 200 milliseconds. Um, we do that today with a MATLAB based platform, so quite high level, and you get to about 20 milliseconds. And then there's firmware level ones that can do it, um, do it somewhat tighter than that. Um, that's uh, that that's very interesting. While you were talking, uh, I'm really sorry that uh, Annette is not here to to join because. Uh, 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 she was uh, 
as I'm sure you know, uh, she was doing uh, much in the area of sleep and uh, and especially uh, interesting for me was uh, how sleep affects the uh, the results uh, of uh, neuromodulation that happens during the daytime. Uh, for instance, um, um, and, and you know, so you're not modulating uh, anything during sleep, but the quality and the the, the amount of sleep really does affect what you achieve in um, in the in the uh, simulation, I think she was doing a lot of work in, in stroke stroke studies uh, to, to begin with. I see that uh, Abi uh, Abhishek Datta from uh, from Ceterix Medical has joined. I think just at the right time, because uh, I was about to start asking uh, a bit more technical questions on types of stimulation like uh, uh, TDC versus TAC, when to use what. I know that uh, TAC, for instance, will will cause uh, a lot of trouble in in um, in the space of of, um, of artifacts. But maybe we can first welcome Abi to to uh, to this uh, little show. Let's call it like that. Uh, Abi, do we hear each other? Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, hi, Alan. Um, and um, you know, nice to. Uh, uh, see all the participants in this uh, in this session. I uh, apologize. Uh, um, you know, I got stuck with another session. Um, there's a session right after this one at 2 p.m. and uh, I'm, uh, I'm the speaker of that session. So we were going through some uh, technical issues. That's all resolved. I'm looking forward to now talk to uh, everyone over here. Excellent. Abhi, uh, can you tell, uh, tell a bit more details on uh, how the, the electrical simulation space uh, the developed? And uh, I know that you actually uh, have now devices that have highly controlled, high density uh, uh, ability to, to to stimulate in various um, uh, various uh, with various shapes in very precise uh, uh, manner. Like, uh, where does the need right. come from, and what happened before? Can you? Absolutely, I can. I'm happy to quickly summarize. I mean, uh, so we work in the field of weak electrical stimulation. Uh, so we are talking about DC, AC, uh, random noise um, stimulation. Uh, the intensity uh, typically varies anywhere from one to two milliamperes, even though people are now exploring higher intensities, three to four milliamperes as well. Um, uh, the field uh, sort of really kick-started uh, with a study that came out from Germany uh, with the advent of uh, using TMS to sort of determine neurophysiological outcomes. Um, so uh, they did a very um, uh, simple study, uh, which, which is now classic. Uh, basically, they determined a baseline using uh, TMS-evoked uh, MEPs. Uh, did TDCS, which is transcranial electrical current stimulation. Um, they tried out different intensities for different uh, uh, durations, and they found that post TDCS, if you go back and do TM TMS evoked MEPs, you were able to increase the uh, the the, the uh, amplitude of the MEP. So if you start with a baseline of let's say one millivolt peak to peak, now that amplitude has raised to let's say 1.4, so there was a 40% increase. So that study essentially led to a lot of interest in using TDCS um, for a host of, uh, you know, uh, studies, uh, you know, in the cognitive space, in the behavioral space, and now uh, basically exploring it for clinical uh, outcomes as well. Um, so the conventional approach is, is basically using bigger electrodes. So these are big sponges, uh, these are soaked in saline, and uh, you hold them on the head using a strap. Um, so our, um, I should say, um, you know, uh, innovation in the space was, uh, we said that this does not uh, make sense from the from the uh, from the uh, efficiency perspective, you know, because uh, we did a lot of current flow modeling and we found out that uh, if you use big electrodes on the head, you are basically stimulating the entire brain. So this is when we uh, proposed using smaller electrodes, uh, similar to the form factor of EEG electrodes. And uh, we basically proposed using smaller electrodes, um, uh, in some cases two, in some cases multiple, and basically leverage uh, you know, optimization algorithms to uh, determine electrode placements in an application specific manner. So what I really mean 
is that um, you know uh, you're not always using the conventional one anode one cathode approach. Uh, the uh, the picture that you're currently seeing on the monitors. Uh, is uh, a four by one approach, which is basically one anode surrounded by four cathodes. Uh, it's basically a ring approximation because you have a central electrode surrounded by multiple electrodes of a different polarity. What it really uh, does is that it basically restricts the current flow to within the ring perimeter, uh, giving you a very focal stimulation uh, in that region. Um, so uh, the obvious benefit, as you can see, is that now you can seamlessly integrate it with EG. So uh, uh, there has been a host of uh, you know studies um, you know combining stimulation and EG in this fashion uh, because uh, you know uh, you know as you can see the mechanical integration is 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 simple i mean there's there's a devil in the details uh but from a simplistic standpoint you can see and you can appreciate that these are smaller size electrodes you can probably use an existing eg cap and you can remove some recording channels and swap them with some of the stimulation channels um, other considerations that come into play is syncing uh stimulation with recording uh so this is where uh things like uh you know are you doing closed loop stimulation uh, are you doing concurrent stimulation? Uh, are you happy with just using triggering on the BNC port? Or you need more of a real time uh, closed loop uh, uh, you know, stimulation, which would mean that you would use uh, some sort of uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, syncing with perhaps LSL. Um, uh, uh, the smarting amplifier by Marine Train is obviously LSL compatible. The, uh, the picture that you just saw is a, is a stimulation system, which is also LSL compatible. So now you can really plan uh, things uh, in, 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 in the realm of, uh, you know, closed loop application of, uh, you know, uh, and planning all these protocols where you're basically, uh, uh, you know, monitoring the brain state and you're delivering stimulation uh, uh, and, you know, doing it in a fashion that you are uh, delivering stimulation uh, you know, and then uh, you know, and you're ensuring that the stimulation is delivered within the within the brain state change. Uh, so, uh, you know, other things that I wanted to comment on is that you know uh, whether you're, whether you're delivering DC stimulation versus AC stimulation uh, makes a difference. Um, uh, there are also physiological artifacts that everybody should be aware of. Um, you know, uh, and that is not because that oh you know if you're combining stimulation with EEG uh, you know uh, you know you just cannot uh, you know do it because of uh, you know uh, technological or, 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 or amplifier or stimulation hardware related concerns but this is really a physiological concern that you cannot really uh, address uh, so these are some of my thoughts on uh, combining electrical stimulation with uh, with with EEG Thanks, Adri. This was a this was a nice introduction to to uh, to a variety of issues. Uh, I wanted to ask Alex, like, why uh, why in the first place uh, are we aiming for uh, this sort of concurrent uh, stimulation and recording? So, what what is it there that um, that you know we are we are we are seeking uh, to to see, for instance, in EEG? Um, so I think you can you can break it down in um, different, different different ways. So I think um, so one way um, is you know, we'll be seeking to observe um, you know, the change in the brain in the brain networks, uh, however measure that um, of the stimulation of showing that it's having an effect um, and having an effect while you're doing it. Um, so it's not a pre versus post thing and if you're doing different durations you know you might see a different brain state in the first 10 minutes to the second 10 minutes to the third 10 minutes however long you're, you're doing that and really as an investigational tool um, so that um, you get more information into what is the actual effect of the stimulation um, because for a lot of the simulations certainly historically they were done just as say TDTS you put one electrode here one electrode there you turn it on and that's all the information you have. <laughs> um, and so give, giving some additional stuff as well um, 
it's, it's clearly beneficial for doing the science. And of course, there's lots of work on um, TDCS, TTES plus fMRI as an alternative method of um, getting um, sewer information. Um, the other one um, escapes me right now. <laughs> what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, it'll come to me. Okay, okay. So um, uh, just before, okay, uh, Nikhil Jacob is, is, is with us as, as well. Uh, he is the person that I wanted to first welcome. Nikhil, hi. Do you hear us? I, we don't hear you. I think you're muted. So uh, yeah, okay. Now, now, now you're fine. You're fine. Now we hear okay. you. Um, hi. Hi, um, just for, for the audience that doesn't know you, you uh, did some very good things on uh, very hard, uh, complex things on uh, recording EG on, on Android. I'm sorry, Ivan, you got, uh, you got stuck. I didn't, I didn't uh, hear much. Oh, sorry. Uh, I just said that uh, you, for those of you who don't know you, that uh, you did some great uh, primarily technical stuff on uh, recording EEG on Android devices and uh, and manipulating it further, and uh, you also uh, pointed to some uh, to some uh, challenges that that uh, were uh, later uh, solved and resolved. And um, I wanted to ask you, like, um, how difficult it is now? We saw that uh, Alex used a uh, pretty pretty nice uh, nice way to to sync to to consumer grade EG devices. Um, but uh, like uh, now, we, I think you're relying on um, an algorithm that is more precise, actually on a protocol called live streaming layer. Maybe not everyone knows about it. Can you tell us how do you make sure that uh, that recordings are, are in sync in such a complex uh, situations? Sure. So we used I we used a smart thing amplifier, like Alex mentioned, and we initially uh, went. We initially tried to use the live streaming layer to get the EEG on a phone. But we found there was delays of like one to two seconds. So it's really large delays. That's why uh, we then moved on to getting the signals directly from the smarting SDK, directly from the Bluetooth. So with that, we get latencies from between like 40 to 50 milliseconds. And that's what you need for closing the loop at the time levels we are interested in. So firstly, I would say like a uh, live streaming layer doesn't work if you want to work on the phone, but on a PC, yeah, it would. And uh, yeah, with that, getting the data right off the smarting SDK, getting it onto an Android app, and we use uh, signal processing algorithms like the PLL, face lock loop. These are much more computationally, more simpler than the traditional Fourier transform based methods. So we use a face lock loop to get a face and frequency and adapt the stimulation uh, using those two measures. So we had no problems with the, uh, actually one other thing that I would mention is when using it on a phone, when doing this on a phone, you need to turn like the location off, get it on airplane mode and uh, do all that sort of stuff or else you'll, you'll see the latencies again. So there's a bit of constraint still, but it works I would say. All right. Um, I think we, we didn't touch one important uh, topic. Uh, that is the topic on, uh, on the waveforms and the type of, uh, type of stimulation. So um, maybe a question for, for everyone uh, in the order uh, you, you choose to answer. Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you determine what type of stimulation do you need? Um, what type of waveforms do you need? And, and, um, uh, and the requirements uh, for, for that, that's, uh, that part of your of your setup, sort of TDC versus TAC, and then uh, uh, waveform, and then uh, higher or lower density uh, uh, stimulation. Oh, we, we've got to bedtime now. <laughs> okay. We have another panelist. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, I, it, 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 in my head, partly, you know, this is um, degrees, providing degrees of freedom. Um, 
and you know there's uh, a lot of research and experimentation with different settings to really probe in to what would um, be uh, most effective for all of the different situations that you might you might actually have. Um, in terms of electrical stimulation, I think what we always um, assumed in my lab, but we've never really done anything about it, um, is that you know, the, the way to go really is the amplitude modulated um, stuff, which um, is really pissing it off in, in, in the literature now, there's no idea what's going on it, which lets you hit both kind of the long term potentialization and then something on top of that as well. And that really gives you um, a degree of a degree of control over the two different effects that are that are going on inside the brain. In terms of say sound and visual, then I think you're much more um, restricted by the technology. So I think if you're doing binaural beats, you're talking about sine waves. You don't really get get much choice. But Nickel might know a little bit more about that than I do. Um, and for visual stimulation, certainly say a, a relatively low refresh rate smartphone screen, um, you know, you're doing on off into the, or, or kind of steps between those types of stimulation rather than sine waves, because if you want to do intermediate values, you've got to do that at quite low frequency. You know, for any, any higher frequency stimulation, you've not got a high enough update rate to give you a custom. Um, All right. Um, I want to I wanna ask uh, Abi the same question, but before that, I have a small question for, for everyone involved here, uh, and I would appreciate an answer. So uh, we've talked about um, uh, EEG with electrical, uh, primarily electrical stimulation here, and also some sort of naturalistic uh, stimulations. So just to know, uh, uh, do, you, do you consider it, do you, do you find it uh, uh, an intriguing area, or or is it still far away? Abi, while while we are waiting for the for the poll to, so, yeah. to end, uh, maybe uh, you are an expert in uh, in 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 all sorts of. I mean, you go long uh, long ways uh, in in the uh, simulation uh, uh, space. Sure, I'm what, happy to. Yeah. What, what happened there, and and why why go high density? Why manipulate the uh, uh, simulation so precisely in both uh, geographical terms and the terms of uh, absolutely, waveform? absolutely. Yeah. So uh, just to um, you know answer your earlier question regarding waveforms. Uh, so uh, definitely from the brain stimulation uh, research standpoint, um, you know it is very clear that when you use DC stimulation. Uh, you are basically, um, you know, planning an experiment where you know that you want to increase excitability of a region uh, because DC, um, you know, uh, we know that positive or anodal current uh, increases excitability and negative current decreases excitability. Uh, so that is one consideration. Uh, typically when people plan AC stimulation, they're really trying to uh, uh, and train uh, endogenous oscillations. So for instance, um, there could be uh, a brain uh, event, which is, which is um, uh, you know, uh, the endogenous oscillation of that event uh, is, is, is a certain frequency. So now if you perturb that network or that region uh, with the same frequency of the of the stimulation, the notion is that you're increasing the power of those of those oscillations of that entrainment. So, so this is one clear distinction between choosing between DC and AC. Um, there is this notion. Uh, again, this is not being confirmed. Anecdotally, it is known that um, uh, uh, AC or high frequency stimulation may be more tolerable, uh, sensation-wise. Again, um, this is anecdotal evidence. Um, uh, now to your question regarding uh, why go high density, um, you know, uh, the, the simple answer is more flexibility. Uh, you can basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, stimulate based on requirement, you know, so the four by one approach, which I mentioned is a very simple, um, you know, uh, approach to uh, focally stimulate a certain region um, you can leverage uh, optimization algorithms, which are basically algorithms which, which tell you that, hey, given a 
target in the brain, uh, give me the most optimal electrode placement to deliver stimulation to that location. And this becomes more and more relevant when you're working with compromised anatomy. So let's say if you're working with a stroke subject or you're working with somebody with traumatic brain injuries, now you don't have the same anatomy and uh, the difference in anatomy will lead to differences in current flow patterns. So now you build these current flow models and then uh, based on where you wanna deliver these currents to, you get a different electrode placement. And many, many times it is just not a one canode, one anode, one cathode situation. These are multiple electrodes. Um, so that's my two cents to the audience over here. All right. Um, I think we are, we are nearing the end of this uh, talk. Uh, so just to be in time, I want to uh, first not forget to thank you all. You were great. And I really enjoyed uh, listening to, to what you were saying. Um, I want to ask a sort of philosophical question uh, for the end. Uh, what sort of neuromodulation do you see uh, happening uh, in, in future in terms of EEG? So coming from the EEG. And then another question coming from neuromodulation, where do you see uh, neuromodulation having uh, highest impact? Uh, and maybe they combine, maybe not, but I want to hear wh what you think. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm really excited with the work that Elon Musk is doing with the Neuralink stuff. They're first going the medical route, then eventually aiming to bring it to consumers. So I hope, especially because they've got loads of capital to accelerate this whole thing out. I hope the semi-invasive BCIs uh, that they're doing, I hope they would pan out soon. So that's what one thing I'm excited about. All right, thanks, thanks. So real quick, I'm sorry to interrupt. I really need to run because of a session at 2 p.m. which I'm sharing. Uh, so thank you everybody. Uh, apologize, I had some issues with the video in the beginning and uh, joining late. Um, you know, it was lovely talking to uh, everyone over here and uh, you know, the, for their questions, please reach out to Ivan and I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, bye-bye. Uh, bye, bye 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 Avi. thank you bye. i think we are uh, we are running out of time just to make sure that you will be able to find this video on youtube just type uh, the title of this uh, of this session uh, or just search for embrain train youtube channel um alex before we uh depart one last question can high frequency stimulation be associated with the possibility of seizure occurrence or harindi just say yeah um, I, I believe that there have been um, instances of um, seizures reported with electrical stimulation and some studies that have been terminated um, early as a result of that. Um, I think most studies would have kind of existing seizures, epilepsy as an, as an exclusion criteria. Um, I think um, to my understanding of the literature, that's very rare. Um, it's so I, I, I don't think anyone would ever say it's impossible, but it's not uh, uh, a, a massive concern at this point in time. It's possible, but rare. Okay, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the talk, and uh, you were you were great. And I think this could last for a lot more, but I, I think we all have. Uh, have to go now. Uh, thanks again uh, for being here and uh, keep uh, keep in touch. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.